Good evening. This is um, the 299th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Stories Symposium. It's a weekly lecture series on comics, illustration, animation, and other work using text and image. It's sponsored in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. And this is Will Eisner Week 2021. And we have a panel about Will Eisner's New York with uh, Dean Haspel and Karen Green and Christopher Couch. And the moderator is Danny Fingeroth. He is the chair of Will Eisner Week and is an author and historian whose latest book is A Marvelous Life, The Amazing Story of Stan Lee, uh, currently out in paperback from St. Martin's Press. Fingeroff was a longtime editorial director of Marvel's Spider-Man comics line and writer of comics featuring Spider-Man, Iron Man, and other iconic characters. He's also the author of books including Superman on the Couch, What Superheroes Really Tell Us About Ourselves and Our Society, and Disguised as Clark Kent. Jews, Comics, and the Creation of the Superhero. Uh, Danny is a consultant to Will Eisner Studios and to the traveling Marvel Universe of Superheroes exhibition. Um, he's spoken and taught uh, on comics-related topics at Columbia University, the Smithsonian, and other venues. So here is Danny to um, tell you about tonight's event. Hi, everybody. Ben, I'm seeing the other, you, I'm seeing you and the other three speakers. Yeah, I'm going to get rid of myself. I'm, I'm tiny. No, but I'm, right. anyway, hi, everybody. Welcome to um, Will Eisner Week. Ben, thank you for uh, hosting us once again for a Will Eisner Week event. Oh, there I am. Um, I'm not really in Eisner's Black Alley. Um, and my hair is, my hair seems to be traversing dimensions. But uh, if you saw my actual apartment, uh, you shouldn't see my actual apartment. Um, oh, there's, there's, there's Karen Green, run by Drew. Oh, there she is. Um, anyway, Will Eisner Week, of which I am the chair. I'm not the table. I am not the ottoman. I, I am not the uh, side table, nor, nor am I. Dean is shaking his head. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. You know, I can't, when we do panels live, Dean is to my side, I can't see uh, the instant response. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, it's Will Eisner week. Will Eisner was born um, March 6th, uh, 1917. He died in uh, 2005. He was one of those guys who when he died at age 87, everybody said, so young. You know, I mean, he, he um, had just finished one of 20 something graphic novels, The Plot, um, The Secret History of the uh, Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which unfortunately is more relevant than ever. Um, Will um, helped invent comics both in the 30s and 40s, especially with the spirit. And then again in the 70s uh, as one of the innovators and pioneers of the graphic novel. So, um, uh, so obviously, so, we, so Will Eisner Week is a in ordinary years. Um, it's my job uh, and the jobs of the various people we uh, we uh, sucker into being on our committees to uh, spread the word about Will Eisner and and nag uh, endlessly. And so we've grown Will Eisner Week through uh, just studied uh, nagging and nudging from one event about ten <laughs> years ago to over a hundred worldwide events. I don't know if you noticed, but this year is a little different. So um, people are not, uh, obviously we can't ask people to do things uh, live. Um, so um, there are Zoom events and other virtual events. Uh, at Will Eisner Central, which uh, you can find at willeisner.com, uh, for the first time we've provided uh, seven or eight videos that can be accessed and even downloaded by anybody um, uh, that are pre-recorded panels that if you want to just watch them, you can just watch them. But if you want to 
make some kind of virtual mix and match event of your own, you can do that too. So we have um, interviews and panels with uh, Jean Lewin Yang and Todd McFarlane and Jerry Kraft and Dennis Kitchen and, uh, and um, uh, lots of other people. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm blind. <laughs> but I mean, it's, oh, Dan Shkade gives you a lesson on how to draw the spirit, Batman, Wonder Woman, and Harvey Pico, oddly enough. Um, um, it's, it, it's just, it's so go to willeisner.com. On the left side, you'll see a, a link. I can also send Ben the link. So, so Will Eisner Week is still going on, despite the fact that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Um, I, let's see, um, I um, have a, a couple of things I'll plug that are, might be relevant on a, on a website called comicsplex.com. I will be teaching a comics editing workshop at the end of April, beginning of May. And sooner than that, on uh, March 13th, I will be hosting an all-star uh, Al Jaffe 100th birthday celebration. So um, that's Al's birthday. Uh, if we're lucky, we may have a pre recorded a greeting from him, but he himself will not be there. But Sergio Aragones and uh, Peter Cooper and Sam Viviano uh, and uh, Karen Green and uh, and and, uh, and and more, you know, more people than than Zoom can probably handle. So both those things are on comicsplex.com. All right. So I think I've uh, well, the plugs the plugs could could go on forever. But why don't we actually start the panel? I'm going to let uh, our panelists um, introduce themselves. Let's start. Karen Green, tell us who you are and how you came to be. Oh, well, that's a long story. Um, I'm the curator <laughs> for comics and cartoons at Columbia University's Rare Book and Manuscript Library, uh, where I also built our graphic novels collection from three titles to about 15,000 titles so far. There's a lot of nagging um, involved. Pardon? There's a lot of nagging involved. I never nag. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to nag. <laughs> um, uh, and we also, uh, in my role as curator, I also um, acquire, preserve, and make accessible the archives of editors, publishers, cartoonists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The most recent edition being Steve Bissett. Um, my Eisner connection, I guess, is that I've been a judge for the Eisner Awards. Uh, and I teach a summer course on how to read comics and uh, contract with God is always on the syllabus, regardless of what else gets switched in and switched out. And that's all I'm, oh, are we plugging things? I will plug sure. that I'm I good. have an, an essay in the uh, recently published uh, book from University Press of Mississippi called Comic Art in Museums. It's an interview with Jonah Kinnigstein. Oh, great. So, cool. um, so there you go. That's me. Thank you for having me uh, be here. Oh, thanks for being here. Uh, I'll sneak in another plug because Ben had mentioned that Marvel Universe of Superheroes uh, exhibition. It's actually opening in Chicago on the 7th. So if oh. you're brave enough, brave enough, I forget the name of the venue, but it's some big museum in Chicago. So if you're brave enough to uh, go to a museum, that's uh, it, it's not just because I worked on it, but if you have any interest in Marvel type stuff from the comics all, all the way through to the movies and everything else, check it out. Chris, NC Christopher Couch. Hi, um, I love Will Eisner. I, I think he's a genius. So um, uh, my name is Chris Couch. I have a PhD in art history from the fine Columbia University, home of Karen's Comics Collection. Um, I teach the largest and longest running history of comics class in the United States, I believe, at the 125 students every fall since 1997. I've been teaching history of comics at School of Visual Arts since 2001. And I've co-authored two books on Will Eisner, uh, most notably The Will Eisner Companion, which I understand Dennis Kitchen uses all the time. Um, I worked with Will for 10 years. I was his in-house editor at Kitchen Sink Press for five years um, and brought in Drop the Avenue and A Family Matter and some other uh, wonderful books by Will. And then after Kitchen Sink Press closed, um, I continued to freelance for him. And I was part of his research team uh, on the plot, The Secret History of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is really a, a marvelous book, a wonderful book. I also wrote a book about Jerry Robinson who created some characters you might have heard of, the Joker and Robin. Um, 
And I'd, I'd like to say one more thing about Karen because she has another Will Eisner connection, which is she brought the artist, editor, publisher, bench, founder of Kitchen Sink Press, Dennis Kitchen's Papers to Columbia. And that is an amazing resource for studying Will Eisner. So, so kudos to Karen for bringing together two of my favorite things, three, Will Eisner, Dennis Kitchen, and Columbia, my alma mater. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And uh, Dean Haspio, tell us about yourself. Hi, hey, Danny. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I'm testing a mic mm -hmm. out here. Yes, you okay. sound yeah. great. Sound yes, better. you sound fine. Uh, so I'm a creator of Billy Dogma and, and The Red Hook. I work for Marvel, DC, Archie Comics. I work for like everyone. And um, uh, Will Eisner has been super influential on my work, uh, especially the way he employs landscape uh, as a character, uh, which we can discuss and I can show in some of my work. And uh, I got to meet him, I think in the year 2000 at SPX, which was a great moment. Uh, Diana Schutz, Dark Horse editor, was walking him around the room and he came up to me and I think I had a comic published by Top Shelf called Boy in My Pocket. And she insisted that he look at it and he flipped through the pages and he gave me this look and he, he pumped his fist and he said, uh, you're the future of comics, kid. And I, I felt like empowered by this moment. <laughs> and then like 20 seconds later, uh -oh. or about a minute later, he was a few <laughs> tables away. And I heard him say the same thing as someone else. And then a few minutes later, the same thing. And I was like, he is awesome. He is, he is uplifting everyone in this room. Hey, Jack, Kirby, Jack, Jack Kirby told me that I was a firecracker. That's amazing. See? <laughs> and look at your hair, and you kind of are right now. Um, and actually, just going back to something that Danny said about somebody that was teaching how to illustrate people, and one of the people they drew was Harvey Picar, right? Well, uh -huh. I I've drawn many of Harvey's stories, including uh, his origin uh, called The Quitter. And the dirty secret of drawing Harvey is I'm actually drawing Dark Side uh, from The New Gods. <laughs> but, a little P car slant. So that's that's my story. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> You've given away your secrets. Um, thank you, Dean. So um, before we go into the PowerPointy slideshow, um, so the, the the panel is called uh, Will Eisner's uh, New York, uh, the city and the master's work. I mean, Will was the quintessential New Yorker. He was born in Brooklyn. Uh, grew up mostly in the Bronx, um, but even when he, you know, even when he left New York and moved all the way to White Plains, and then after that moved to Florida, which, you know, both those places you could see is kind of just the next stop on the D train, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, he, he always came back here. He taught at SVA for years. Um, it was funny. You'll see, I put together a long, a, I put together a long PowerPoint that I that everybody's going to participate and comment on, you know, everybody on the panel, and then, uh, uh, and then uh, Dean and uh, and and uh, Chris also put together uh, some some of their own personal uh, takes on on Will. But Will really um, lived in multiple times. You know, when I was putting this together, because uh, you know, you know, you want to, you know, I've done a lot of you know, biographical things, but this one of Will, but this was about New York and specifically how it influenced him and his work. So you go to his childhood and you go to his youth and 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 you have certain images, you know, there's a lot of laundry flapping in the wind, you'll see tonight. <laughs> um, but then you get to the later years of his life and his graphic novels with Will wanting to be kind of the Saul Bellow of comics. Suddenly there's this examination of everything that you're talking about in his past, their memoir or very thin, you know, either directly or thinly veiled. So uh, a, a lot of things where you go, well, does this belong, does this image belong in the beginning or the end or both? So, um, so it's just, but, but I mean, New York so fueled him, um, specifically the, you know, first gener, the Jewish immigrant Bronx of his youth. Um, and, and, and Will really is of the generation of Stanley, of Erwin Hayes and of Jerry, you know, these are, you know, these are uh, the people who created the groundwork for what we do now. Um, 
if you're here, you probably know this. So, um, <laughs> but uh, it never hurts to hear it again. So I'm, I'm going to go into the visuals, and and I hope uh, you know I know Zoom makes cross talking somewhat difficult, but cross talking is encouraged. So let me let me deftly share the screen because uh, what could possibly go wrong? Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, don't look. Don't look. <laughs> Okay. Danny, uh, Danny, I always uh, thought that the laundry that appeared in uh, Eisner's comics, which was abundant, was like a metaphor for airing dirty laundry. Like that you was know, just... we, we, that's possible. Although, you know, although laundry on a clothesline would be clean, would it not? Yeah, but back then it was you had to wash it twice. <laughs> it wouldn't be clean for it wouldn't be clean for long on that's right. That's true. That's true. <laughs> 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 so this is an image from a spirit splash page uh, and we'll see the full one later. Uh, Will always, uh, whether he, he often worked, very interesting, even in both the graphic novels and the spirit material, Will uh, rarely call, even if he said it was New York, he'd make up Dropsy Avenue or, or, or fictional locales, you know, with Wall Street maybe being an exception. I think he liked having the freedom of not having, you know, to be exactly, you know, you know, photo perfect. And yet in this, and yet in this subway scene, uh, in Central, apparently in Central City, there's a Lexington Avenue, a Grand Central, a Times Square. So uh, <laughs> look, what an amazing coincidence. Okay. I wonder um, if, that, if that was an assistant that, that added that by accident, you know? Uh, then he let it slide, so yeah, yeah. you know he's the showrunner. Well, they never said that there wasn't a license in the Grand Central or, or a Times Square. Yeah, that's true. That's well, true. you don't know that it's Lexington. It might just be Lex Avenue. It's Lex. It's Lex <laughs> Avenue. It's Lex. It might be that universe where Lex Luthor became president. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You just oh, don't know. Oh, wait. we were living in that one. Okay. Anything next. Goes in Central City. <laughs> this is Will at age twenty-four. Um, um, and uh, somehow there's the there's the five of us, and then somebody <laughs> is at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Anyway, um, this is Will Eisner. Uh, in his, I think uh, actually Dan Chicade uh, put up on Twitter a, a drawing based on this. So Will is 24 here. He's working on the short-lived Spirit Daily strip, as opposed to the Spirit Sunday comic insert, which lasted 12 years and obviously was revived and reprinted a million times. So this is this is Will in his youth. This is this is the this is the Depression era Bronx. I believe the Yiddish writing on that chicken market might indicate it's the Jewish Bronx. I do not know exactly what street, but this is the venue that Will uh, that Will grew up in. You know, this is this is the poor lower middle class um, um, Bronx. Um, wait, I gotta. Oh, wait, there's another shot of it. Um, these are the kind of streets. Uh, there's not only was that bread not gluten free, they're <laughs> proud of their gluten content. Yum. <laughs> uh, this is some classic photos of, of New York restaurants of the era, uh, Depression era, men on bread lines. Uh, this is tenement living um, with. Um, with the clothes on the uh, clothes that's hanging out to dry. This isn't, this is, you know, and then here's Will's interpretation of, of clothesline, you know, and from several different angles. This is from Contract with God from the Street Singer. You know, it's, 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 um, it's kind of like elevated trains. You don't see much laundry outside hanging out. And you, and, you know, I'm still wrapping my brain around the fact of how much of New York was covered uh, by elevated trains. This, 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 is the, this is the other side of the tracks. This is the fancy schmancy Bronx. This is the art deco of the Grand Concourse. And that too was part of Eisner and his, and his generation's influence. Um, these, the, this new modern happening uh, architecture form, this is sort of what to aspire to. This is, you know, when Bob Kane, uh, the co-creator of Batman with Bill Finger hit it big, he moved his parents to the Grand Concourse. Uh, this was, you know, and, and Will and, and, and everybody uh, of that era, but especially the artists, the comics artists that, that we uh, love, 
would go to the, this was the Lowe's Paradise Theater. It, it, it was one of the Lowe's Wonder Theaters. Um, and they would, especially through something like Citizen Kane, they would just sit for showing after showing after, after showing. And the, you know, this, you know, you could live in a tenement, but here was this movie palace. This was DeWitt Clinton High School. It still is DeWitt Clinton High School. Um, it's one of the, uh, you know, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton's of the uh, comic book world. Mm -hmm. uh, Stan Lee went here, Eisner went here, Erwin Hazen, Bob Kane, and Bill Finger, sure, you know, uh, people from, from all walks, Patty Chayefsky and Dan Shore and James Baldwin. This was uh, mm -hmm. in the North Bronx. And this, this is where a lot of, you know, a lot of, for these guys, um, this was Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, you know, Oxford. Uh, there's the Clintonian board. That was the yearbook, I think. Um, and that, um, wait, sorry. Uh, Will, I don't know if anybody's ever figured out exactly which one of these is Will, but he was oh. the art editor of the Clintonian. Hmm. Seymour Wright was like a big comics artist, right? Did he do Cast for the Friendly Ghost? Pretty sure. Um, oh. Anyway, so this was, this was Will um, at DeWitt Clinton. Um, this, this is the Clintonian. Will drew the cover and, and uh, he drew a lot of, he did a lot of drawing for the uh, news, for the, for the, for the um, yearbook, the Clintonian and for the, um, and also for the newspaper. This is a cartoon or not a, a political cartoon at the Forgotten Ghetto, Bronx, whoop, Bronx's Forgotten Ghetto Reveal, the School for Crime signed by Eisner. Um, and then this was sort of the dream New York. So that's one New York. Anybody have any, I don't want to just, uh, anybody have any uh, observations or comments? Well, I didn't, I didn't know, he was a dancer? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. You know, he's so talented. You know, he's so talented. He's so talented. <laughs> He saved up. He saved up. He saved up. He saved up. Uh oh. Um, uh -oh. This, uh, is this is good. This is good. Somebody has to mute me because somebody has to mute because I'm echoing. I'm echoing. Penny Haddis, can you mute yourself? Penny Haddis, can you mute yourself? Okay. Okay. All right. No. All right. Somebody has to, has to mute. Somebody has to mute. Uh oh. Okay. Um, so this is the glamorous New York, of course. That also the Hollywood New York. This is still Hollywood, but less glamorous. This is from Dead End. That's Bogart, obviously, and uh, Helen Jenkins and Joel McRae. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Bogart is a is a gangster who's come back to the old neighborhood. Um, and that, and in Dead End are the uh, Dead End kids. It's a young Denny O'Neill, <laughs> second from the left. <laughs> Leo Gorsi, I love it. I love it. Leo Gorsi, is that on the left, Bob Dell? Yeah. Sorry, Denny O'Neill's from St. Louis. Yeah. Details, he, details. Yeah, well, me too. He went to the rival high school. Ah. <laughs> But this, so, so this is the, you know, the mythological, mythologized version of poor uh, New York kids. This is the real version of New York newsboys. Um, there have been movies and stories, but these are these tough kids who uh, would set up in front of uh, building, office buildings and subway stations. And uh, on one particular uh, newsstand on Wall Street was, was manned by uh, young Will, uh, Will Eisner. So that's, this is from a, to the heart of the storm. So that's sort of the framing device at the top, but uh, I'm pointing to my screen, like you can see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look close, look at this. Um, but the, this is, this is, this is a, a reminiscence that Will uh, drew of, of his time uh, selling papers on Wall Street. And this is a, a casually violent encounter um, between people uh, fighting, uh, sometimes to the death, and certainly uh, to the uh, you know fiercely beaten um, for a choice spot on uh, on Wall Street or on any place. But this is uh, this is how Will uh, apparently got to um, 
have that the corner he had, the, the setup he had, and there's his father. Uh, somehow his father is trying to impress some guy from Texas for some reason. But that's this is a Will remembering himself as a newsboy. Uh, th then as Will got older and, and more successful packaging and drawing comics, he uh, he moved to that fancy building on the right, which is part of Tudor City, but still couldn't get away from the laundry. Nope. <laughs> nope. You can never get away from laundry. I yeah. mean, this is, that's New York. It's laundry. That's New York, and this is right. I mean, right now, this is, this is around where the United Nations is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I yeah. mean, that's that's the. I mean, that's as ever the incredible contrast of New York. If you uh, you know. Is that if you peer, if you pull back the curtain a little, this is the front of Tudor City. <laughs> you know? It's also where Larry Lieber, uh, Stan Lee's brother, at one point uh, lived and and drew and wrote. Um, and then here, this may look very Eisnerian. This is uh, the theater in tu near Tudor or in Tudor City called the Tudor. <laughs> and of course, there's um, this uh, elevated subway tracks. Was Tudor the developer name, or does that some, mean something else? I don't no, know. it's it's got a kind of fake half timbering at the top, so it's uh, it's evoking the Tudor era. Yep. Oh, the wait, what's it? What's it? What's a Tudor era? Oh, what? Henry oh. VIII, Elizabeth the First. Oh, gosh. Okay. So, if, <laughs> so if you live there, someone will will chop your head off. Is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or you don't see the adultery. <laughs> and, and, Eisner elected to not draw the guillotines. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so so Will uh, would adapt this into in, obviously into his comics. Uh, he even did a book called The Building that is based, I think, on a fictionalized version of of the um, Flatiron Flatiron Building. And and so this so Will then suddenly, you know, New York. So the spirit, of course, came about. Will uh, had been a successful uh, packager of comics with uh, Jerry Iger. And uh, then he had a chance to do a comic book insert for newspapers, which all wanted to get in on this comic book fad that literally all the kids were reading. Um, so he took a chance and and went uh, and went with that syndicate. And and these splash pages, as most of you know, became trademark. But here's, despite the fact that it says the name of the character, it still is a very credible Will Eisner urban design. Uh, this 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 mm. is New York. I guess it's seen from across the river, but this is pretty atmospheric. <laughs> I, I have a question: Was the Spirit a kids comic? No, right? Absolutely not. Right. Will Eisner left the comic book business because he didn't want to do comics for fourteen-year-old cretins in Iowa anymore. Right. That's a quote. Okay. Wow. Yeah, but, but but Chris, I will I will I will I will sort of disagree with you on that in that it was in the newspaper, so it was for, quote unquote, the whole family. It was, but um, Will created a comic like the other comics in the newspaper that adults and children could both read and get different things out of them. He was he was Pixar before Pixar. <laughs> <laughs> Rocky and Bullwinkle before Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> he was, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but he wanted an adult audience. Yeah. That is what he sought his entire but you're, but, but you're right and that well that was the holy grail for all all the cartoonists in that era was to get out of comics and get into syndicated strips a for the money but b to be able to write at a more sophisticated level yeah but will didn't didn't you know he wasn't interested in a strip so much he did the spirit daily as a spin-off of I, the spirit oh no just like but he wanted a comic book in the newspaper because he wanted comic books to be read by adults Right, but and it was it was syndicated, but it not not it was maybe the only maybe there's one other comic that was ever it was a spirit section. It had three other strips, including one yep. by Pfeiffer, one by Klaus Nordling. Yep. So I'll just you know the, the, this is very early in in the spirit. This has been like the first month of the first like six weeks of the spirit. But he's got the city back there, a little generic. Um, but you you know it, it's it's New York, and then and then flipping ahead. This was the story that Pfeiffer wrote, but uh, always said that he channeled Will and attributed uh, as Will as the auteur. This is about a guy living in one of those, you know, uh, crappy brownstones we saw earlier in the Bronx. Um, who is down on it? Look at look even look even draws in that first panel. I never even noticed that. Look in the background. Yeah. Guy yeah. comes down the stairs. Holy cow. 
yeah. whole movie right there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, and of course, what, uh, you know, what are 10 minutes in a man's life? Well, duh, you know, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Turns out not not a very good ten minutes, um, you know. So it's playful, but it's deadly serious and noir, and and yet the spirit logo is there on a billboard that apparently uh, is just there selling the spirit. Uh, and then this evokes this is the candy store newsstand social gathering place place where you got your phone calls because most people didn't have phones. Uh -huh. And and there's the beloved. Jewish immigrant uh, candy store owner who makes egg creams and Freddie's got a big decision to make. Um, hey, you kids, get Mrs. Schmidt in the next house. She's wanted on the phone. So, I mean, this this is not that far removed from the graphic novels, you know, in, in, in just this day of, you know, uh, anyway, so Freddie, spoiler alert for a 70 year old story, but Freddie ends up accidentally <laughs> killing him killing the candy store owner who's known him since he was a kid and he's trying to hide it and suddenly it's discovered. And then look at that last panel. That's, mm. you know, and it's, and, it's the, and it's the living Bronx here. It's the living uh, Eisner past. Such a great uh, use of white space too. Yeah, yeah. And then the sound effect. You know, Oof, and was, brilliant. Um, and th this, is, this was Will's personal favorite spirit story story of Gerhard Schnabel um, about a guy, I guess he was a mutant, if you look at it technically, who discovered he could fly <laughs> as a the child. The first X-Men, he's the first <laughs> X-Men. <laughs> oh, but he, did, he didn't find Dr. Xavier. <laughs> nope. <laughs> no. So, so he, he um, and as it says right up, right up there, this is not a funny story. So, um, it was about a, a, a boy who learned he could fly, but it was repressed by his parents. But I wanted to especially show it, not just because it was Will's favorite, but I mean, here he literally uses a picture of New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the St. Patrick's Cathedral. Right, right. Yep, uh, Fifth Avenue. Those caption, <sighs> this is just such an amazing page. I, I Every time I, I see this page, it, it it stops me again in my tracks. And I remember when uh, there was the Eisner's New York show at MoCA, they had the original art for this and you could see the paste up of the, mm -hmm. the caption lines on it. And it just, they had the whole story there. And it was, you know, you just, you're in tears by the end of it. And, and what, I, what I love to a certain degree most about this story is that Spirit is like, a, he just makes a cameo. Oh, but, he, he, but he's a catalyst. Right, in, in a lot of his stories, he's virtually a cameo. But you know, this there, I've seen several versions of this page. I don't know if it was because of the photo it got damaged. I, I don't know what, but there are several iterations of this if you, if you look online. It's interesting, but they all use, I think they use the photo. Uh, and this is the story. Um, you know, you'll, I think later we'll, you'll see kind of a lot of influence of this on Dean and, and, uh, and, and uh, say that bottom panel is kind of, as well. Oh. I mean, it's is it true that I mean what Eisner was not a fan of superheroes, right? In fact, he didn't even want to give the, the spirit the uh, the the was the it called the di diamond mask or something or whatever it's no, called. No, no, he, he he did not want to do a superhero, absolutely not. So um, do you feel like this made, story? They made him put the mask on. They yeah. made him put the mask on, and do you feel like this was like a commentary on superheroes for for him uh, or? No, uh, it's it, it's a it's a Hasidic fable. Is it? Yeah, huh. well, it, it's not really, but it's like Rabbi Nachman of Prague. It's that kind of story. Huh. Um, you know, there are religious figures who can fly like magically. Uh, there's a monk and different people. And it's, 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 it's really, it's his most Jewish story in some ways. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's, it's really, you could, you could find it like in, in, in Yiddish, really, in Eastern European, you know, Hasidic uh, uh, parables. Hmm. Well, it's kind of a war it's kind of a warning story about not being true to yourself. Also, you know, I mean, I think I think Will was always worried about that, at, or mm -hmm. you know, different well, times. I, I I also think I think it's about parents too. About yeah. parents, Definitely. parents Definitely. crushing children's dreams. His parents forbid him to fly. Um, I think it's also a metaphor about you know being an artist, right? Because you know creativity is flying. It's mm -hmm. just a beautiful multi multi-leveled story. I, I love teaching it. It's just, there's 
so much in it. And of course, Eisner was also a master of using, I'm about to plug something, I'm sorry, but he's a master of using um, lettering. You know, he, he understood that it, that, it, that it was as much part of the artwork as the artwork. You know, Absolutely. Form, letter forms. And on the eighth, um, at the, from Michael Dooley's um, thing that he does from his art school in California, we'll be talking about Eisner and design. So. Oh, awesome. So be there or be square. Uh, this is more of Schnabel, and and again more of. I mean, look at that second panel of him flying. Look how happy he is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's very. Uh, it's still very New York. There's the uh, the water in the distance that kind of melds into the sky, and 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 here the spirit is. I mean, it's 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 really beautifully layered story. Uh, uh. But the spirit story does sort of take center stage, but you're very aware of. of Schnabel. Ah, you'll have to read the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, this, this was another one. I was just saying to Ben before we started, this is called Heat. It's, it's weird, there's two spirit stories called Heat, but this is the one that is real. This is a hot New York day, a hot Central City day. I will never understand why Will put all that lettering over this incredibly beautiful page. <laughs> Very odd, but I mean, there. You know, so there's the Bronx. Of well, I, 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 it's possible that he was evoking, you know, um, early cinema had a lot of like, you know, chirons. And I mean, I've always said that his his landscapes were like a font, like, you know, it was like a, a wordscape, you know. Um, and maybe he was evoking kind of like I, my, my father loves movies and he would get 16 millimeter prints of certain movies. And I remember like a lot of the trailers had tons of like, you know, language on top of the images to sell it. And maybe he was trying to evoke that feeling here. I don't know. You know, this, this reminds me almost of the beginning of the original, no, not the director's cut, but the original version of Touch of Evil where they put mm -hmm. all the opening credits over the incredible camera work. Which is ridiculous, right? <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Well, this, is, this is this story, I mean, the spirit is literally flat on his back for the entire story. He, you know, he explains in in captions that uh, that he's um, that that his that his enemy, the octopus, has has knocked him out. But look at there's the spirit. There's the spirit logo. Is it on the first page? Well, I guess it's mm -hmm. well, it is. Yeah. It's, it's right part there. of the type there. Oh, yeah. it's part of the title. But then it's it's on a newspaper that the that the uh, sanitation truck washes away. And this is, this is this from the shop in the original artwork, but not that I have the original artwork, but it's from a stat of, you know, from a scan of the original artwork. And then here, again, here is his entire, is, is like, this is like an entire course in comics, this page. Mm -hmm. Look at that lettering in the final wow. panel. That is just, just amazing. And again, then, this is like his great mashup of cinema and theater. Like this mm -hmm. could have been a play. This could be, I mean, even though he changes the angles, the fact that the spirit is laying down basically in one area as, as a story happens could be a play. Yeah, Will, Will said that a comics were closer to theater than to cinema. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it could be in one of the graphic novels. I mean, if it wasn't an adventure story, mm -hmm. it's almost like that one about the guy who talks to the roach. What, is that a life force? It is, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's ba that's basically the same setting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and then, of course, there's laundry here. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta have laundry. A lot of laundry. Yeah, yeah. The, look, uh, <laughs> there's laundry, but it, but uh, there's a conversation about, and and you know, you know what I think, Mrs. Scully. I think it's the times we live in. All this is sort of a punishment. Yeah, maybe not for kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that laundry is like a visual shortcut to allow the reader to know what part of town they're in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the buildings themselves might not give it away if you don't mm -hmm. know the city really well, but the laundry is wow. no getting past what the laundry means. Yeah, oh, you can't yeah. afford the dryer, you know. Exactly. So. Yeah. Class marker. And yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it could be another city, but you're pretty sure it's New York. This is Black Alley. Uh, holy cow. <laughs> you 
Where was he even standing to get this perspective and draw this? <laughs> Danny, Danny, you just make it up. Yeah. You just make it up. <laughs> you just I mean, make it look good. <laughs> you have to be like on a crane above the subway, above the subway platform. The elevated shed is so perfect. Oh, yeah. And the and the staircase going up to it. That's just, I mean, you see that still all over Queens. Mm. Christopher, did did he have like did he take his own pictures? Did he take his, make his own reference? Um, as far as I know, he didn't use, you know, he must have used photo ref, but uh, as far as I know, he didn't take any pictures. Yeah. Right. Uh, so this is more of Black Alley, which uh, is, in, you know, an incredible story. The spirits chasing somebody on the subway, on the elevated tracks. Uh, and of course, you know, you talk about the, you know, the, the telltale uh, class divisions. Uh, look at Chase. It's a cop, the spirit, but and then you know, uh, you know, uh, redacted cops, and so their sympathy is not with the spirit. They're not. They're going run, Mac, run. <laughs> you know? um, so th yeah, this is again the subways, and 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 it and it's it's, it's kind of almost shot through a fisheye lens. Some of these panels, they're very extreme mm. perspective, Ooh, and then really? this is the, you know. Um, Ordinary inking as well. It's incredible. Great use of blacks. Yeah. When, and it, when they did a really dark story, um, they they called it a two bottles of ink story in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And, he, and, he's got, and he's got the water towers, of course. You of know. course. And then here's the climax where the spirits, mm. the bad guy, and then you know. Is this gray because it's really just a color? version this that's great, been made great because i think it's from the um the the warren uh reprint uh, well i think it's probably from the kitchen sink reprint or the kitchen sink one of, yeah i think this is from this is from the warren though but is this uh, supposed okay. to be in color are we looking at color that's been turned to gray is that the no, no, we're, looking, we're looking at a at a gray right so in other words was that zip it tone it's not wash is it right. this was this was from this 1970s reprints from will's original art oh oh this, wow. this is not this is not how it originally appeared this is, okay. this, this is from its second life only Got 45 it. years ago. You know. Got it. Got it. This is the new, the new version. <laughs> sure. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then this is this is the story called The Killer. That's the one we saw in the title. Oh, those uh, eyes. Yeah. God. Test yourself. Kind. Oh, look, test yourself. Kind, respectable, honest. You're wrong. He's a murderer. <laughs> well, so, you know, Will was very, very aware that the spirit section was in a newspaper. Um, that's one reason why he did seasonal stories, just like all the other comic strips in the newspaper. Um, and he also did puzzles. This is a mm. puzzle, just right. like, you know, the jumble or something that's on the first page of the spirit story. The other thing is, Will never did a set logo for the spirit. Um, it was always diegetic like this. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the reason he did that was because he said that people do puzzles in the newspaper and people who were seeing this week after week would incorporate that into their like puzzle play inside the newspaper to find a logo in the weekly spirit. It was the thing that would attract <laughs> readers. Nice. So it's like, a, it's like a Hitchcock thing, like Hitchcock cameo almost in a way. Or, or, or like or like the Ninas and her in the Hirschfeld. Or the Ninas, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Even better, okay. right? Um, so, the other thing is, uh, if uh, if if I had been asked to do a comic book for the newspaper, I would have said, "Oh, a comic book. It's got to have a cover, mm -hmm. right?" The <laughs> spirit section does not have a cover, mm. right? The story begins on the opening page, mm -hmm. and that's because if you have if you're getting the spirit section, you've already bought it. Because you bought it in the newspaper. Yeah. The cast you don't not, have to be sold. The cover's not the come on. You don't need right, the cover to come right. on. You, you need the first page to get people to read it. And then um, I always tell my students, last week's comics sell this week's newspaper. Yeah. Right? Because you, you haven't seen it. And if you could get the readers to read the spirit, and want to buy it again the next week. Oh, right. That was right. that was what you wanted, and they wouldn't buy it unless they read it. Right. So there's no cover. And it's an eight-page pullout in the middle. Yeah, it's a sixteen-page. Sixteen? Did any has any have any of you ever seen these original? Yeah, yeah, they, oh, they're, they're, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
There's oh, cool. tons, tons of them around. You could you could buy them pretty cheaply, actually. Yeah. Oh, cool. And so Pfeiffer had a strip, and Klaus Nordling had a script had a strip. Lady, I had a patron once email me with a, a picture of the front of a spirit um, supplement, saying that he he'd gotten this thing and he wasn't quite sure what it was because it was missing its cover. Oh. I just awesome. <laughs> started laughing. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> of course, not having a cover also made it cheaper to produce too. You know, aside from the other aspects. Sure. Yeah. True. So I, I I flipped ahead to some you know yeah we'll, we'll go back in time too. But this is uh -huh. Eisner doing the Beautiful. subways, you know whatever 30, 40 years later, just his memories or observations, and this is um, some prints he did. This is pretty, you know, Gorgeous. whatever age, but he certainly was not young when he did these. This is. You know, this is just a, and then now we're getting the old. Remember that young guy? This is Will. Mm -hmm. According to, I mean, the weird thing is, if this is a 2004 San Diego, this is like six or seven months before he died. This is how good he looked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He looks it, great. He really did die too young. Really, yeah. he, mm -hmm. you know, he kept he uh, he would always say, you know, I feel like I'm still a promising young cartoonist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, and then, and so of course, this was kind of the game changer for Will for the comic book industry. Um, it was a, it was four really graphic novellas, but Will had you know done the Spirit. He'd done even earlier than that. He had done superheroes and jungle heroes and every, every possible kind of uh, genre you can imagine. Then he spent twenty five years doing uh, educational and military and instructional. Uh, stuff and then suddenly he goes to a comic convention in New York and gets the idea or or at least solidifies the idea that he wants to do something serious you know that's not for kids and this is uh, some pages um, and you know what does he do what what's his what's his uh, you know uh, you know uh, doing what he thought was probably a one-off thing a, his one chance to do a serious graphic novel where does he go back to the Bronx and get to a fictional yeah. avenue, you know. Um, we have the correspondence between Will and Dennis because it was at that um, it was at that comics convention that Maurice Horn walked up to Dennis Kitchen and said, "Will Eisner wants to meet you," and Dennis was like all a flutter, uh, and he went, <laughs> he went. I mean, you guys on the panel probably know this story already, but he went over to meet Will, and Will was standing by a table, and he had an underground comic in his hand, and. Uh, and he looked up at Dennis, who had reached out to him earlier, and he said, this is what you published? And he was looking at um, <laughs> S. Clay Wilson's uh, yeah, head kick, right. yeah. which is, you know, and, and so we've got the correspondence where uh, Dennis writes to Will after the, the show and says, you know, I'm enclosing some examples of what we publish. It's not quite as extreme as, you know, what you were, <laughs> as, as Wilson's. And, and so we've got kind of the back and forth. And yeah. then uh, Dennis invites Will to do a cover for Snarf, and then they're just off to the races. And mm -hmm. it was really that exposure to the underground that made a contract with God possible. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's you know this book be, is is kind of a pivot pivot point uh, between this traditional comics and and the graphic novel as we know it. This sense of uh, personal stories told in a personal style. Uh, it's, just, it's just extraordinary. When I, when I teach this, um, when I teach Contract with God in my summer class, my students are always struck by the fact that there's no nice people in it. <laughs> like, All these people Whoa. are so horrible. And like, yeah, how many nice people do you know? You know, are <laughs> living in a tournament, life was hard. Have they, have they read <laughs> the name of the game yet? <laughs> Probably not. Oh, God. <laughs> um, so so I, I want to put in a word for School of Visual Arts. Please do. Um, because, uh, you know, Will was hired to teach comics at the School of Visual Arts because a bunch of young Turks there wanted the school to go back to its mission as the cartoonist and illustrator school. And they asked Silas Rhodes, who should, who should I get to teach this? And they said, oh, we want Will Eisner and Harvey Kurtzman. So we went out and got Will Eisner and Harvey Kurtzman. And, and that was another thing that inspired Will to work on a contract with God was that 
we had all these young students who took comics seriously and he started coming into class with like thumbnails and drafts of the stories that would become contract with God and asking the students, what do you think of this? Huh. So it was really, um, you know, cause I teach, I teach at School of Visual Arts and have for a long time. And, you know, there's lots of amazing alums out there like Jerry Kraft, the first, um, for, first graphic novelist to win a Newbery Award, a graduate of School of Visual Arts. And anyway, that part, part of what gave birth to contract with God was that milieu of young artists passionate about comics who are taking classes with Will. Cool, and this, so this, this is, you know, but it is interesting, right? He's, you know, well, I used to think he was old, but of course, uh, I think all of us except Dean and are older than Will was then, and, uh, but maybe even Dean. Wait, how, what year was this that he created? 78. 78, and how old was he? Uh, 51, six, wow. 61, 61, right? He's born in 17. That's right. That's yeah, cool. he's 61 here. Wow. Uh, embarking on this incredible, you know, third act. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, this is the Bronx. This is uh, what Harvey Kurtzman labeled Eisenschritz coming down. This is uh, Will, you know, Will's, Will Eisner Weather. And uh, so this, um, and anyway, this is the this we later found out only uh, uh, shortly before he died that the story about uh, uh, this um, religious Jew's uh, daughter dying as a teenager was a metaphor for Will's own daughter dying at 16 of leukemia. But he uh, had told you know very few people outside his family and closest circle of friends knew, and even after he did the story, you know most of us didn't know. Uh, but I I, I want to. You know, a lot, a lot of those, a lot of the, uh, this is the story in the book that really is very much about, you know, the Bronx mm -hmm. and, its, and its people and the Jewish Bronx specifically of the 30s. Um, it's called Kukulain or Kukulain in Yiddish. It's, uh, it refers to a, uh, a cabin in the, usually in the Catskills, which were not the fancy Catskills hotels of legend, but they were basically bungalows where um, you know, usually the wife would cook the meals and uh, the husbands would often work in the city and come up on the weekends, leading to all sorts of shenanigans, as you might imagine. Um, <laughs> not necessarily. What? <laughs> in, including Will Eisner losing his virginity. So here's, here's some laundry. Here's some, uh, uh, you going to cook Elaine again this year, Fanny? I've got a choice. <laughs> there is a lot of laundry. Uh, this is uh, going to Fagel. Big, big families. Big families have a lot of laundry. <laughs> and I get, did they even have washing machines? Or was this all like hand laundry? It was probably done in a in a tub with a with a ringer. Yeah. Uh, so this is so uh, Benny, the you must sugar now. You can't afford a car. I rented it, Mom. Going to the mountains, and so everybody's going to the mountains. Um, girls with class use a taxi, Mom. Um, uh, and then this is this is. Can you can you go back a second? Sure. Can you go back to that one? Uh, uh, one of my students pointed out that uh, Willie and his brother are looking out those windows like they're looking into a panel. I mean, it, it's like a. Uh, it's pretty like a comic. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And they're getting yep. They're getting ready. They're getting ready to go. And so they. And that's where Goldie works. That's her job in the garment district, which was, you know, the, uh, Eisner and Iger actually worked out of uh, a former garment district um, loft. And that's, that's where they first met when Eisner came up to uh, and, and ended up helping Iger out of a, out of a mechanical jam with a, with a press of some kind. Uh, <laughs> the guy in the back is singing, my wife's going to the country, hooray, hooray. Um, <laughs> Uh, tomorrow morning, that's when I start my vacation, so she's ready. And then this, uh, so I'm not showing the whole story, but this is um, eventually a 15-year-old Will Eisner uh, losing his virginity to a, uh, to a um, enthusiastic uh, guest at the hotel. And Bancroft. And Bancroft, exactly. <laughs> Cougar. <laughs> yeah. this was yeah she's she's got to be like 35 yeah 
<laughs> so this, I guess this probably wouldn't have been in the spirit, you know? Um, you know, I just had a side thought, like uh, this kind of presents an interesting, uh, like, like there used to be a template to life, like <laughs> summer would come and there were certain things people did in the summer, you know, like some, you ever see the seven year itch with Tom oh, Yule and yeah. Marilyn Monroe? Like, Absolutely. That kind, this kind of reminds me of like, and I remember as a kid watching that movie many times going, wait, what do you do in the summer? And then what are you supposed to do during the year? And then it's just kind of crazy. And, and all this is to say that it's making me wish that like Eisner was a lot, I would love to see the kind of city he, he would present in this pandemic mm -hmm. time, you know, like, oh, God, yeah. it would be amazing, you know? Well, you and, know, his, Chris, maybe you can talk, his theme really of everything was survival. That was the mm -hmm. ultimate Will Eisner theme. Mm -hmm. Did yeah, he do any cool. stories about epidemics or, or, does, or does, yeah. No, not that I know of, but you know, he, his protagonist uh, did discuss survival with a cockroach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I interviewed yep. Will, you know, uh, you know, for an interview that got reprinted a lot. It's in that Will Eisner Conversations book, and originally did it for for my Right Now magazine for Tomorrow's. And he was very, I think we talked a lot about how just the theme of everything he he writes and draws is survival. That's sort of mm -hmm. the ultimate topic. And then, so the summer is over, and uh, you know, his I think his his mother has discovered his father's girlfriend and uh, he's moved out and there's the lettering again, right? Move, Billy, mm -hmm. vacation's over already. So start getting ready for school this year. You're going to have a lot of responsibility around here, like Spider-Man. Your, <laughs> your father is going to be uh, traveling a lot. So he's going to be the man of the house now. You hear me, Willie? Willie? Yes, that's that so good. Yizzle. <laughs> Yizzle will be the man of the house. And... Uh, you know, can I just say, I think that uh, Will would have found pandemic New York very familiar because mm -hmm. the streets were uh, empty. People were on their balconies and fire escapes talking mm -hmm. to each other and, you know, banging their pans at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. There was just people were relating to each other in a way that was very pre-technology. That's funny. I mean, not to plug myself, but I will right now. Oh, but please, please. Uh, please do. Yeah, I do. In, in, in my current Red Hook season four, it's called Blackout, which I wrote at Yado in September of 2019. Uh, part of the story toward the end of this, uh, is there's this villain that wants to turn New Brooklyn back into the Stone Age because she need, <laughs> need to. The worst thing that happened to Earth is mankind, according to this villain, which isn't totally wrong. Anyway, um, and. But the Red Hook and his mother, the Coney, are able basically to stop this turning <laughs> back in time to around the 60s, 70s, 80s. And, and then New Brooklyn decides to embrace this technological austerity so that people can be on stoops again and we have newsstands and we don't have cell phones necessarily. We don't have the internet because of the, it brings ba us back to a certain time where we, we talk uh, to each other rather than at each other. And I picked that up also from Will Eisner's New York, you know, uh, a little bit, because I, I also remember that time as a kid and I kind of, you know, as an old, as an old man, my, well, I'm getting there, <laughs> see it on my face, but uh, I, I love that, that, that era, you know, and these kinds of stories that just kind of humanize us even more and connect us, you know. Well, the best thing about that era is that everybody was black and white, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, we color came in in like the 50s. Now, do you think that that apartment would now be a million dollar co-op? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I lived in a studio in a tenement building in Hell's Kitchen for my first apartment in 1978, and it was $200 a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, like 10 years ago, there was a New York Times Habitat piece on little studios in hell's kitchen and they were going for 2500 a month yep. so yeah and wow. this is like a 300 square foot apartment so this, <laughs> so this, this is uh, just another angle that will actually drew i think for a later uh, version chris is that right this was this was not yeah a... he did some uh some fill-in uh, uh panels to link the stories in the uh, anthology that norton did so this is a fill-in panel yeah <laughs> that's pretty good
yeah. Well, it's it's an extra page to link up. To oh, I know, page. I know. Yeah, it's, but yeah. but yeah, it's really it's it's filler. Yeah, and it's and it's really and it's a self portrait, you know. So yeah. so this this gets us into um, just some of the things he did in in New York, the big city, and and the, and city people, a couple of different sort of portfolio and short pieces. Um, you know, it's very interesting. You know, empty street, and again, he doesn't specifically name the street. He wants the freedom to evoke the sense of New York, you know, which um, the old and the new, this is angry street. There are streets that are really, that really do not welcome travelers. <laughs> yeah, I've lived on those. I love the uh, torn out spiral notebook page effect of that. Yeah. yeah. So good. Yeah, the stuff, I mean, it, uh, yeah, that, you know, I was looking through some of this stuff, obviously to prepare for this, and it's just, you know, stuff that you don't, that's not even, in your main Eisner consciousness, you know, right. right? Oh, look! I think I think I see the spirit uh, struggling to stand up in the background yeah. there. You know, uh, smell. Will had the nerve <laughs> to depict smell visually. Naturally, oh, short thrillers yeah. tend to be very aware of city shots. Um, God, uh, that reminds me of the garbage strike in the eighties. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry. It's a time. Anonymity. <laughs> this, is a, this is a guy apparently with a woman he's not supposed to be with. Apparently, if, you, if you're staying at the Hotel La Sleaz, <laughs> <laughs> might be a problem. Up that. to no good. Yeah, people yeah. keep recognizing him. <laughs> Come on in, Herbie. How's Helen and the kids? <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, it's the bar connected to the Hotel La Suisse, you know. Uh, and then just a few random images just because the internet exists and I couldn't resist, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which book, which one is this, is this from Contract or from? Uh, I think that's, that's not from Contract. It's part of the storm. It's part of the storm. Yeah, this is, yeah. is close-up panel, but since we're in that snowy part of the year. I love that book. Yeah. It, I, then, I think it's his best part of the storm that 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 always kills me that that image right there is so incredible there's so many narratives happening in one image right yes it's like it's a, a single panel made up of about 17 different panels yeah it's incredible and and of course in our current covid world it's like those people get, get away from each other what are you crazy <laughs> No, they're in the same pod, Danny. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh, somebody snuck a cover of my book in there. Somebody. Like, How did that? So, that's so inappropriate. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Will Eisner is discussed in that book, by the way. Um, and that's the end of this part of the presentation. And we'll, we're going to move on to NC Christopher Couch has prepared some images. So tell us what you got, Chris, and then tell me, tell me next when you want me to go next. Uh, I will. Um, one of the things that I believe about Will Eisner is, well, he was always trying to get people to take comics seriously. Um, so when he started doing the graphic novels, he invented a new artistic style for his graphic novels. Um, it's the same thing that Jack Kirby did when he started doing um, the Marvel Revolution comics. If you look at his style there, it's so different from his 1940s style. So mm. Will knew that he needed to do something different than um, the Spirit um, or uh, PS Magazine. And he was inspired by the Ashcan School artist. This is a painting by George Lukes, uh, who is the other artist who drew the Yellow Kid, actually, who became an important Ashcan uh, School artist. So next. Oops, wait, hold it. There we go. Um, this is a painting by uh, mm. John, John Sloan. Um, and the Ashcan School artists all drew New York City. They drew all classes in New York City. Um, they were very socially aware. Uh, John Sloan was the art editor of the Marxist magazine, The Masses, which was shut down by the federal government for sedition. Okay, next. Um, and when, when you look at Will's style in, in his graphic novel, starting in Contract with God, it's very different from what he had ever done before. Um, and by using the Ashcan style art style, he gave the novels a kind of political consciousness and an urban atmosphere. Um, it's something that actually readers would recognize because the Ashcan school was really um, 
very well known. Um, there were always Ashcan school paintings to, uh, on display in the Met. Um, there were still artists working in the Ashcan style who, in newspapers uh, who were doing socially aware comics taken as an X. Um, and their image of the city, you know, partly inflected by, you know, Dyke and photographs and stuff, but they really saw the city in a lot of the same ways that Will did. Um, you know, they were, they were the first artists who, they had all been reporter, reporters. They'd been journalistic artists before they became Ashcan school artists, like uh, Robert Henry here. Um, and this is so much like an Eisner street scene um, mm. with the details. Uh, let, let's get the next one. Um, and, and you can see Eisner's always looking at the vertiginous qualities of the city, um, the closed in streets, the details, uh, always dealing with, um, uh, well, usually dealing with lower class folks. Um, so it's very much like the Ashcan school artist. And, and that was, you know, I, I, I always tell my students that Will Eisner was a genius, um, you know, because he understood so many things so well, right? Um, he knew that if he wanted comics to be taken seriously, they had to be books. And actually, Contract with God is really remarkable because it's the trim size of a literary novel. Hmm. And that was something new in comics. And I actually looked that up in a publishing textbook from the, the 1970s. Uh, trim sizes mean things, portrait, landscape. Um, this is the trim size of a literary novel. It's different from the size and shape of comics. Okay, can I have the next one? Um, <laughs> for Danny, here we, got, here we have laundry, <laughs> okay. Um, and again, this is a painting by John Sloan, um, who was really interested in doing images of women, respectful images of women. His hairdresser's window is really famous. Um, and he's really looking at women's labor. I mean, he, you know, he, he, he was a commie, what do you want, you know? So, um, and I, I think that kind of uh, representation of women's labor, um, Eisner always had strong women characters. Um, all the femmes fatales in the spirit had professions. They were professional women. Silken Floss was a surgeon. Um, even Pigel was a French teacher and a headmistress <laughs> yes, of a school. Yes, she's a French teacher. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, name isn't like Pigel. Isn't, yeah, like, with a name like isn't that like those signs that used to be all over the Upper West Side? Uh, French lessons, you know, that uh, <laughs> I don't think they're really for French lessons. Any, sorry, Chris. Go on. <laughs> I think that's excellent. Yeah. So, all right, let, let's get the next one. <laughs> there we go. More laundry. Okay. Mm. All right. Then the next one, uh, here's a contract with God. Um, and so the other thing that Will Eisner did, um, so that's all New York. I mean, that the Ashcan School artist painted and drew New York in a similar way to Eisner. Um, and he, uh, I mean, he was looking at Franz Masriel um, and Lynn Ward and other people, but I think the real heart of his style is kind of this urban, socially aware Ashcan school style. Um, the other thing that he did was, and Will always wanted comics to be taken seriously and read by adults. And believe me, when I was working with him, he was still concerned that comics be taken seriously. When he did Last Day in Vietnam, he did it with no word balloons. So mm. he said that was to try to get people to think of it not as a comic. Um, so when he started doing graphic novels, he tried to do them in different genres that people would recognize as literary. And, you know, there are many reasons why Will would turn to Jewish life in New York in the 1930s as a subject. It's because it was his own life and he was familiar with doing, but also it's because Jewish American literature by 1978 was a respected literary form and people could understand that this was a novel that, you know, maybe the writer could even win uh, a Nobel prize like Saul Bellow. So, and Eisner kept doing that. Can I have the next one? Singer. <laughs> yeah. One, go, well, and, maybe go. didn't. No, and Roth didn't get it. Maybe Bella did get it. My bad. Sorry. Yeah. No, I think I think that's right. Anyway, uh, you know a lot more about Jewish American literature than I ever will, Daddy, including uh, who uh, who screwed who, uh, both <laughs> figuratively and literally. Um, I, was just, I was just thinking of a cover of the poor issue with a forward from uh, ten years ago with a. After Dylan got his Nobel, and uh, something like, and a picture of Dylan and Philip Roth, and and it was something like, 
We just gave it to Dylan because we just want to keep fucking with Philip Roth. You know? <laughs> oh, God. Um, um, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and anyway, this is the first edition of a contract with God. Um, and uh, Will didn't coin the term graphic novel, but this is the cover. And you can see it says a graphic novel by Will Eisner. This is the first work of non-genre, entirely original comic art to be published with the term graphic novel on it. So, uh, okay, Danny, I think I've got two more. Uh, you do, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is Dropsy Avenue, which I love. And, um, you know, this is a story about New York and it's another genre. Will was always trying to get people to read these books by using different genres. This one is a sweeping historical novel, right? With multiple generations of characters. It's a different genre. He was trying to reach an audience with books that they would understand, okay? Um, he also did, uh, early on, he did a science fiction thriller called Life on Another Planet or Signal from Space because he was trying to pitch his novels to, uh, you know, the readership of novels. Okay, and then the last one. Um, and this is, Family Matter, um, again, it's about Jewish New York and everything, um, but it's like, you know, an elite family, you know, kind of, you know, stabbing everybody in the back drama. It fits into Eisner's oeuvre, but it's also him trying out different genres to reach readers. So, cool. anyway. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And uh, we have now, uh, Dean has put together some, Dean gave me a bunch of slides and I, Put them together in whatever the hell order I wanted. So, <laughs> hey, wait, what? what, are, what are, where's Where's Karen's art? Karen Green, where Where are your pages? Where's your artwork? Uh, uh, in the In the library. In the library. In the library. <laughs> uh, uh, with the poker. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Karen's art is the comment. Karen's art is her commentary. And her. Uh, and her acting. I want to be. I want to. I want to sit in one of those Shakespeare. Yeah. So uh, this clearly is inspired by uh, Eisenhower because look at it. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the spirit in you know whatever. Uh, I, I was trying to come up with a cover for her for this project, and I couldn't think of anything. I I done some other drawings that were more you know traditional covers, and then I was thinking about it. I was like wait, he's this, it's about this, you know, young Harvey Picard that's just kind of had it with society in some ways. And, you know, we're going to learn that he was basically kind of a bully in, in some mm -hmm. ways. And, and this is him negotiating society uh, in a very s simple graphic, you know, and hopefully it's compelling enough to make people go, hmm, you know, like, I, I want to open that up and see what that's about, you know, and, and it's kind of noir. And, you know, I don't know, I love noir. And, you know, I, I don't know what I was watching back then. It might have influenced me as well, but it's definitely Eisner. I remember where I was. I was sitting in a coffee shop trying to figure out this out. And suddenly I just drew the title out with him walking away. And then I was playing with the extruding the letters and, and giving them form. I was like, wait a second. Mm. And like the the is supposed to be like antennas almost, you know, from a, a oh, building, nice. you know, nice. kind of thing. Yeah. So, and then the R is falling over because, you know, he wanted people to know that he was a quitter. It wasn't called the quitter originally. It was originally we played with the idea of calling it street code. No, yeah, street code, huh. which was something I convinced Harvey of right. because I was in love with that Jack Kirby, the one autobio story that Jack Kirby did called Street Code, and I mm -hmm. felt like there was a lot of that kind of in there. So we're going to call it that. And then one day he called called me up and the editor and said, "We're going to change the title." I was like, "What's it going to be called?" He goes, <laughs> "We call it the quitter." And I was like, the quitter? I don't know if I want to draw. Why is it called the quitter? He, he's like, because I was a quitter and I want everybody to know I was a quitter. And I was like, okay, all right, let's <laughs> call it the quitter then, you know? And then I came up with this title that feels like, like there's a, a tension, you know, uh, a struggle with this kind of realization or this, you know. Absolutely, because uh, he's, you know? he's walking away in such a combative yeah. manner. He's exactly. not the slinking yeah. away like a quitter. Yeah. He's That's right. Well, you know, the quitter is really a book. It's a great graphic novel, by the way, but it's a Thank graphic, you. it's a full length expansion of that one panel in the Harvey Pekar name story mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm. where, where, Harvey, where Harvey, where Trump draws him making a clenched fist like people 
people learn to not make fun of my name one way or another. That's right. That's right. And then and you read this, and you're like, he used to beat people up, man, like Harley. So yeah. So I, I just thought that was a prime example of how you know influencing me. And I don't remember what I gave you. So let's just click through. Okay. Yeah. This well, you gave me a. Oh, here's a Harvey. Now again, you can make any just, New York connection to this stuff. That would be good. But yeah. Well, in in this case, it's probably a Cleveland toilet. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's also theatrical. It's very it's yeah. it's very Eisner esque yeah. in that it's the same space except for some close ups. And again, his struggle with. Uh, doing this. In fact, the cover I drew for this issue was a four-panel sequence for a cover that I was inspired by Steve Ditko's Spider-Man number four, where Spider-Man's fighting Sandman. So it's kind of like my wink at that, but it was him plunging a toilet, you know, because <laughs> that's Harvey's drama, you know, and something we can all relate to. Relate to, absolutely. Yeah, well, I, I, although if we were in New York, you have, well, I guess toilets could still be stuffed up if you had a water tower, ta tank on the roof. Yep. Yeah, that's right um, and then we go into your into so this uh, is something i did call i, I did uh 10 issues of the fox for archie comics and oh, i guess i'm showing this created by Irwin, right uh created by Irwin. in fact created, yeah. there's a page coming up that i'll 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 talk about Irwin in a second but uh so uh, you know once again the city being you know kind of becoming a character and, and even though the layout i'm having fun with the layout here you know the city and props you know and it's not just character and villains and other stuff. And and yes, this was colored and lettered, but I'm just showing the black and white pages yeah. that I that I provided. And again, you know, flowing through the air and you know, jumping into inset panels and just keeping it moving and keeping a certain flow. Um, I forgive me, it's not Charlie Chaplin. Who am I thinking of? The other guy. Keaton Buster. Harold, Harold Lloyd. Buster Keaton. Buster Keaton. Buster Keaton. Like I always thought, I mean, I was basically drawing Buster Keaton here, which also reminded me of the spirit, you know, like you also basically drawing Gerhard Schnabel here. Exactly. <laughs> Gerhard Schnabel, the first the first X-Man. <laughs> and the see, and he's one. shaped like an X in that inset panel. There you yeah. go. See? <laughs> and then, You're giving uh, it away. I know. Shh, don't say. And then and then like <laughs> You know, again, this is just a sequence. There's a subway here, which, you know, an elevated subway, which is something that you can see a lot in, in the spirit uh, or in, in, you know, mm. his New York stories and whatnot. Yeah. And, and again, like, Human even Vegas. I have the, the, if you go back one day, wow. if you go back and he's like running up on top, I know I'm pointing at my own screen too, but like, I'm just <laughs> using the character. Like, he's running on top of her tentacle at, at the, the upper right, but then he's being, it's just insane. It's like having so much fun with layout, you know, exploiting the real estate of the page, which is okay. something that Eisner did, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. Spirit's big villain was named the octopus. That's right. Right. right? And this is, uh, yeah. this is a this is a something Satan, Miss Satan. I forget her name right now. But then again, here there's a train coming, and he's being trapped by her, and just again playing with the elevated subway and and using the city as a character. Were you, the next of, were you thinking of Eisner when you did this? Absolutely, you know. But I was trying to take what Eisner did and just keep running with it, oh, you sure. know, like having fun with it. And you know, he's he's grabbing her tentacles and tying them up into a bow to <laughs> keep her trapped on that subway platform. So that I think the next page is the end of the yeah, and she just explodes Whoa. into just you know, and, and then he's jumped down and gets you know uh, showered with her eyeballs and guts and stuff like that so she what, she, she manages to live teeth. huh i love the flying teeth oh thank uh, you <laughs> yeah. oh yes you could say what's 10 minutes in a octopoid uh, demon monster's life here it is <laughs> this is what it looks like and, and you're seeing her bridge work you know while she's that's on right. the bridge. That's right. <laughs> bridge work on a bridge that's the, the meta that's very meta i didn't know i was that meta and of course, she basically her eyeballs survive and bounce away, and he just kind of faints, like he's wow. just tired of this crap, <laughs> you know, like in in a very Eisner esque way, you know. And again, playing mm. with cityscapes. And the crazy thing when I look at this stuff, you know, these are just pencils. Really? There's no there's no ink here. You're kidding? What? No, no these way. These are pencils. So I had learned how to how to basically pencil really tight. And then scan them in, and then tweak that line to make it like a black, a very black line, you know. Uh, oh. And then fill in the blacks where where necessary with with the uh, Photoshop. So wow. Oh oh oh, wow, got it. I see. It's not okay. like this is only pencil. You have no, it, it's pencil then digitally manipulated. Got it. Digital. Right. Okay. 
because I was about to say, how the hell did you do those blacks with yeah, a pencil? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then cool. na nowadays, oh, hold on to that one, Danny. Nowadays, uh, you just draw digitally. I still use, you know, pen and ink and everything else. So, so this, yeah. this, this, thank you. So this next page, Danny. Next. So I believe, can you go one more? All right, go back. Yeah. I so <laughs> this page I drew the day, like I drew it, and then I found out that Irwin died. Which is crazy. Oh. Oh. Which is crazy because he co-created the fox, and I have the sequence where the fox is digging out of his own grave, and I'm just like, "What?" It was that was so crazy yeah. to me. Like, anyway, so Erwin Hasten, who co-created the um, with a, a guy, I'm forgetting the writer. I'm going to say Joe Don Baker, but it's not that or Don. <laughs> I don't know. Chris, What's it? I don't know. No. Um, it, forgetting it his was name. For, it was for Archie Comics, though. It was for Archie, yeah. So, because wow. uh, it was created in like 1940. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Joe Blair. Joe Blair. That's Thank what. You. It was. Wow. Thank you. Uh, and I'm then very good with Wikipedia. I see <laughs> that. And then the next page. Now, Joe Blair uh, sounds like a fake name. I wonder who Joe Blair really was, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, Blair Stein. And again. <laughs> I'm just showing like some out of out of sequence, you know, pages and panels from a comic I then did called Street Code. I love ah. this. Thank you. Which then got collected to something called Beef with Tomato. And um, this is just, I, there's a whole narrative that kind of ends on that panel where uh, a guy is coming out stumbling drunk while I'm riding a bike past it. And there's a whole, there's a whole reason for that if you read the story. But I just like the sequencing of it. Again, that reminds me of Eisner. You know, yeah. because he's such an influence. Um, and I guess this is just more, this is just a, a cool panel, uh, you know, in Dumbo. I tell a story about Dumbo. And I think this might be the last one I, I sent you, right, Danny? Uh, uh, yeah, well, I, put, I, I, put, I think I put most of the story. You know, look, Dean, as, as, right. as much as, you know, millions of comics are set in New York. I mean, obviously, Kirby does it in Ditko. Um, and yet somehow you've, I mean, to the point of, of having different boroughs and 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 parts of New York emb embodied as character, you you really kind of become the ultimate, you know, uh, you know, graphic balladeer of New York. Well, I definitely celebrate it a lot. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, I I do think about the city as a character, and and, and I think I said earlier that Eisner anthropomorphized you know the city and gave it a this breathing heart so much so that I kind of adopted that idea in this current Red Hook comic I do where uh, Brooklyn reveals herself to be sentient so much so uh, that yes. you be she becomes heartbroken by the toxicity of the world. This is something I created in 2015, 2016, I think, and decides to physically literally secede from New York ergo America to start her own republic where Art can be bartered for food and services. <laughs> and and that, that idea actually comes from Kirby in a way, not the specific idea, but the idea that if you put stuff out there, it's like cartoonists and, and a lot of artists and creatives are very prescient in that way. You know, like in Star Trek, you have communicators and now, you know, we have communicators, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, Kirby uh, would create such crazy ideas uh, and, and, you know, suddenly we're, you know, we have mother boxes and other kinds of things, you know, uh, happening. Uh, the source is kind of like the internet in a way. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. And, and, and with Eisner humanizing, you know, objects and space, you know, embodied by, you know, um, the frailty and, and uh, the faultiness of humanity, you know, uh, is the stuff that it's, that's how we relate to each other. You know, I can't relate to a knight in shining armor, but if you stumble and fall, I've done that. I know what that's about, <laughs> you know, so. Well, you, you've kind of synthesized Kirby and Eisner, you know, it's very, mm -hmm. very interesting. So yeah, I'm going no, to take, take us out of the, out of the visuals now, and I'm going to stop the screen share. Ooh, here we are. Hi. Um, hey, everybody. So Ben, maybe we should uh, see if anybody has any questions. Is anybody? Oh my God, there's 21, there's 21 things in the chat. 
Uh, I, mean, I think the chat that. were comments during our talk. Oh, oh, okay. Like I think somebody wrote cougar when we were talking about the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right after I said cougar, somebody wrote cougar. That made That's me laugh. Right. <laughs> um, you ben? can put your name in the chat and we'll unmute you, or you can. Okay. Uh, if you have a question or a comment. Anybody have anything? I actually have a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ben Catcher, like. Okay. Clearly, Eisner influenced you, right? I mean, uh, you know, his work wasn't very visible when I was growing up because mm. this is before any of this early stuff was collected or print. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we didn't. It was that moment in the seventies, early eighties, and uh, mm -hmm. no, I didn't see it. Uh, I saw. Someone put out, I remember an early collection of the dailies, the spirit dailies, but I didn't know the, um, you didn't, didn't see the it that well. You, what? Didn't, you, didn't, you didn't see the Pfeiffer book when you were a kid? Uh, yeah, I guess we saw some things in there, but. Uh, Great comic book heroes? Yeah, but I think I was like him. I was looking at underground comics. I mean, I, I think there was a, um, that generational thing going on. So, uh, so yeah, we, you know, trying to make comics that didn't look like commercial comics. That was a very different generational thing, I think. Ben, a, lot you of your, but a lot of your comics are, sorry, go ahead, Karen. I was just going to say that, Ben, you definitely relate to the city in a, in a way that's very, very similar. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's true. Some city, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> something we have in common. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, ben, 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 where'd you grow up? In Brooklyn. Uh, which part? Uh, mainly Crown Heights. Mainly Crown Heights. Ben, I remember you saying once uh, that people always think that the city of Julius Knipple is like any big city that they live in. You know? Yeah, that was that was not a, sp a specifically New York. So uh, I've done a few things. I mean, about New York, but like the dairy restaurant is all about New York, oh, but not a not the, not the comic strips. Um, so uh, you know, I think people are rooted in their period, their time. You know, the kind of movies and theater Eisner was looking at. Uh, that was something, you know, that seemed very, um, a kind of uh, melodramatic period thing that, that, that I didn't, uh, it's hard for, harder for me to relate to. I was, I don't know, I was looking at a different period of movies and um, different things. So, yeah, I think it's hard to escape your, uh, you know, yeah, I wasn't looking at the, the uh, Ashcan school, I was looking at 18th century Italian drawing and something <laughs> so out of out of uh, that, that uh, the idea of what comic, you know, uh, comic book drawing styles. So and it, yeah, it's different period things go on. It's influenced by Shields and Yarnell. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Who... Sorry, I'm just making a stupid joke. <laughs> I don't even but, get you know, it, but it's funny. That's, that's uh, how come that's how these things work. That's right. <laughs> there was a panel at New York Comic Con a few years back uh, with Jules Pfeiffer and, and Darwin Cook about noir, noir oh. and and yeah. uh, uh, I ended up putting together the slideshow for them because <laughs> Paul Levitz was doing the moderating. He will never do a slideshow. Um, so I put together a slideshow because Jules really wanted slides and he had sent me a, a list of uh, his like his favorite noir comic artists and favorite noir films. And I was able to put to find like a comics image and a noir image, a film image that fit like you could see the direct, uh, mm. you know, heritage of of the images that uh, were being used in the comics that were coming out of the films of the time. And you can definitely see that in, in the spirit and, and even in a lot of the, the later work. You, it's just the use of, of shadow, the use of, of chiaroscuro is so rooted in, in the movies that he was seeing at the time.
Yep. And I would imagine also uh, changed significantly by his experience of going off to war. Yeah, and I, and I think I think Citizen Kane was a game changer. I mean, mm -hmm. all those all that generation talks about sitting yeah. watching it over and over and over. Chris, so, I wanted to ask you what yeah. what what's it like to come into work and and be told so you're going to be Will Eisner's editor. What? Uh, <laughs> oh, what was that? You know, like? Well, that's that that's a funny thing because. Uh, you know, I've been around pop culture my whole life. I grew up in science fiction fandom and kind of, you know, met Isaac Asimov when I was 10 or something. So um, I think what, you know, and actually my brother-in-law had been Will's editor before I started working at Kitchen Sink Press. Uh, oh, Dave, oh. Dave Schreiner, who was uh, oh, uh, sure. Will's, Will's favorite editor. He wrote yes. a lovely uh, memorial to him after he passed saying the finest man I'd ever known. Um, and so I, I, I had some big shoes to fill working with Will. Uh, but, you know, we, we would make a lot of jokes about Will, which is uh, he was the only artist who would ever turn his work in on time. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, uh, you know, I was also uh, Mark Schultz's editor. And, you know, uh, Mark would take longer to do a 22-page comic than Will did to do a graphic novel. <laughs> and Will would always say, Okay, well, it'll be in you know next March, and you know, second week of March, the next year, there would be the graphic novel in the mail, you know, just just right on time. So, uh, he was really wonderful to work with, and I think he liked having an editor who was an academic in some ways. Uh huh. You know, um, uh, because I don't know, you know, being having your comic book editor have like a PhD from Columbia, <laughs> that probably felt pretty good to him. I think, right? You know. And, and then, but the other thing that was really nice, you know, going into this was I like knew everybody, uh, I knew the artists and people I was working with before I started, right? I mean, I'd known Dennis for years already. I met him at a softball game um, that the Krause Publications put on in Wisconsin. So that was the first time I met Dennis. I didn't actually play softball, I was just there. <laughs> so it was, you know, it was, it was cool. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's it, yeah. I was just going to say that one of the things that really stands out to me about Will Eisner, a, apart from being an artist, is um, through going to cons, going to tables, looking at underground comics, right up through the Eisner Awards, you know, personally handing uh, the statues to the winners, looking at their work. He looked at everybody's work. He, he didn't stay in his lane. Yeah. He wanted to know the entire breadth of what this medium could do. And yeah. there's so many people uh, who just look at the comics that, that are like what they do. Yeah. And his curiosity, I can't think of anyone who has, the, had the, who has or has had the breadth of curiosity for what the medium could do that, that Eisner had. It's just an extraordinary thing. And, and I think that, that we suffer for that, from not having more of that cross-pollination. And, and, and to never be willing, I mean, you know, comics by its nature is a bulk business. You make money, you, most people are paid by the page. Yep. And, you know, even a lot of very good artists develop a set of poses and approaches to situations and staging and they just keep doing it. Maybe they do it really well, but they, and, I, and, and obviously Will has ticks that get repeated, but he, as you said, is willing to, to learn and to, and to be enthusiastic and to try new things, both to try to do new things and to learn new things. It's pretty rare, you know, I mean. It's well, a lot of artists I feel are, that I've met are very introverted. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out if I'm an introvert. I, I don't think so. <laughs> So, no, like to be there's shirts on, Dean. Yeah, I think <laughs> the, whole, the, whole, the whole shirt thing, the whole shirt thing, Dean, is uh, I know it's, it's kind it, of a giveaway, it betrays everything. <laughs> um, but what I loved about Eisner is, and and in fact, the the all you, the, the five of you, or four of you, I'm, I'm the fifth one, the other four of you, oh. is the, the community <laughs> aspect and, and how we sanction each other, and, and we're hungry. For, for comics and hungry 
to meet the people that that innovate and make these things yep. and yep. you know like, like everything even today with the popularity of the movie versions people aren't going to read those comics at all mm -hmm. you know like no, people are probably. discussing wandavision you want to go find out about scarlet witch and <laughs> go read the comics they're already did 30 years ago right like that's the source material right but they're all so confused i'm like anyway but but what I, and 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 for me to have any kind of career i mean you know has been because like people like karen green like acknowledging me or ben acknowledging me and doing a panel with him or or, or danny you putting me on three years worth of wizard panels you know like that's amazing <laughs> Chris, you owe me something. I don't know what it is. So, <laughs> you know, like that's comics. That to me, that's yeah. what, the love of comics, and that's why it works. Is because you were on the first panel us. I ever organized. Oh. Really? Oh, that's yeah. that's awesome. New York but, Comic Con. Oh, okay, awesome. Do you remember that the what the title was or the? It was about comics in academia, and I I brought cupcakes. I remember that. I remember because I didn't <laughs> belong on that panel. No, <laughs> I you just, totally did. Totally and and I told everyone I didn't belong in that. <laughs> and that and that thing that I think we were all involved with that comic New York, Karen. That was nine years ago. That was wow. so fabulous. That's right. That was that March was really 2012. Mm, wow. Yeah. Crazy. Wow. You know, I want to say something else about Will, and I'm gonna probably get this story wrong. It's a story that Scott McCloud told at a panel uh, I was on in San Diego a few years back about uh, expanding your horizons. McLeod had just discovered Tezuka and he had, and he had this huge book and he took it, he took it to show to an artist, like a famous long-term artist whose name he refuses to reveal. And the guy wouldn't even open the book. He's just, he wasn't interested. Wow. And then he stopped by Will's class at SVA and uh, uh, the students were working on something. So Will, you know, was free at the desk and Scott wandered in and, they chatted and he showed him the Tezuka book and Will sat down and he's like paging carefully, 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 looking at just every page, kind of drinking it in. And then he stands up and he holds up the book to his class and says, see this? This guy isn't a slave to the close up like you are. And he's a God in Japan. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Wow. <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, so, are, are there any questions from the uh, the audience? Uh, I don't. I don't see any. Am I missing anything? I think a guy named Dan was raising his hand. Yes, that's me. Uh, I was going to say that uh, there are a couple things I would add to this. The first thing I'd add say is to all of you is that one of the things I like uh, very much, besides the art itself and the great storytelling that comic books provide, is that the people who create it are generally down to earth with the exception of Dean there, but, uh, <laughs> um, uh, but you know, accessible. And that was true. I met, I, I went by Will Eisner studio in Florida in November of 2004. I was, uh, wow. I'm not an artist. I'm a fan. I got aware of his work in college in 1976 with reading the spirit in a, a course called, um, introduction to comic book art what, and, what, school, uh, what school was that SUNY Binghamton it was in the cinema department oh yeah. uh, who was teaching it um it was what it was a TA under Ken Jacobs oh that's oh, I, wow. I, I graduated there in 76 in the cinema department oh okay I I was playing in the cinema department but I had a lot of conflicts with Ken and I ended up being a creative writing and lit major and then a math major what, what may I ask your last name I know you've only gone by your first Theodore. name Theodore. Okay, we must have crossed paths somewhere. Yeah, um, and what? Uh, but what I wanted to say about Will is, I went by his studio because his the address had just stuck in my head. And that in November that year, my father had a heart attack. I flew down to Florida, and while I was at a doctor's appointment, I realized I was just a couple of miles from stu Will's studio. So I drove by, and there's you know, uh, poorhouse press in a medical arts building, um, <laughs> and he has a secretary. I went in and the secretary said, who are you? I said, well, I'm, you know, my name's Dan and uh, I'm just a big fan of Will Eisner's and I, I would love it if I could meet him. And she went in the back, she came in and she said, Mr. Eisner, we'll see you now. <laughs> and I was brought back to a studio. Now, you know, I have to say by 
2004, my reading of comic books and particularly my love of his work is, you know, I'm, I'm being introduced to a God in his throne room. Um, you know, he's surrounded by his Harvey Awards and, uh, and, his, and his, his drafting table and all these things. Um, he ended up sitting down and having a good half hour conversation with me. And uh, he was particularly aware of a lot of what was going on in the art, in the comic book world that we talked about a whole range of different artists and writers. He particularly liked blankets just to pick a book. He happened to mention that day. That was awesome. What just happened? Somebody screamed. I, like, no. <laughs> uh, I know that uh, some people took that book very seriously. It was a great book. And I, I you know, he was very aware and he emphasized story over picture. And that was very important to him. And then after about a half an hour, he stood up, he got a copy. He did show me the proofs for the plot, which he had just gotten that day. And he then stood up, he got a copy out of uh, Spirit Archives, volume 12. And he said, I don't want you to leave empty handed. Mm. Now, I know what that meant. That meant, but I want you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so I did take the hint. Um, I did later meet up with his nephew, who's also an actuary like me, uh, who actually worked in One Pin Plaza, same building I was in. And he said his uncle was always like that, always trying to get back to work. He always had work to do. He wanted to get back to it. But... That was like, as I wrote, <laughs> times I had a great conversation. Some, somebody needs to mute themselves. Just yeah, blew really? them <laughs> I think it's Stephen D. Meyer. Blew, blew them up. <laughs> but I appreciate and I appreciate being part of this. I wish I could have been paying full attention. I'm ignoring a meeting I'm supposed to be in over there. Well, we're gonna put it, we're, it's going to be put up online soon. So you'll be able okay. to see it. Again. But I want to say how much, you know, Will's work and it drew me into comics more than I had been in my whole life. And, and I continue to be a great lover of this stuff. And, um, and uh, I appreciate all your contributions to it. Oh, thank you for, for coming to the panel. Thank you. Any, thank any, you other, any other uh, urgent, uh, I think you might, we've been going almost two hours. So maybe it's time to. <laughs> I ordered Chinese food like five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> I love the virtual panel. You can get so much content. <laughs> well, you know, the thing with panels or anything is commuting, right? I mean, right? Especially if something downtown, you have to travel like two hours to get yep. to this hour event and then two. This, no, this is in many ways, you know, aside from the alienation and, and end of the world, it's terrific, you know? <laughs> Besides, yeah. All right. So, um, I guess thank you so much, Dean Haspiel, Karen Green, NC Christopher. You can call him Chris Couch. Yeah. Um, Will Eisner Week. Go to willeisner.com and uh, click on all the different links, and you'll see all the different things we have: the the playbook, uh, the addendum. Don't forget the addendum. Very important, and all the different videos, and just spread the word about Will and graphic novels and free speech and everybody stay well um ben i will thank you to, to wrap it up take care yeah see you next week okay everybody. thank Bye -bye. you so much everybody thanks, thanks, thanks so you. much it was thank fascinating okay great panel thanks thank you thank you everybody good to see bye. your faces <laughs> thanks ben thanks danny bye-bye thanks, 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 th